I just thought this was a very insightful quote that we pulled from one of your recent conversations. I think with Jordan Peterson, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you said that what you have to do is create a landscape of incentives that is ruinous for those who attempt to corrupt it. If you don't do that, you will create an evolutionary arms race in which those who are wishing to corrupt your system for whatever reason are seeking those quadrants where you can't detect them. Um, I would love to hear you expand upon exactly what you mean here and really um, opening up that word corruption too. I know it's it's etymologically related to rupture actually, which is an interesting biological term, um, but has a lot more meanings beyond the biological. So what what did you mean by, by this particular phrase? Well, it, let's say we agree that we should have a governance structure because we who are the governed are better off if that structure does its job than in its, in its absence. Yeah. If it preserves life, liberty, and property, all for it. Right. Yeah. So, okay. We agree. Consent of the governed is essential. We agree that we want to have an empowered system that's capable of, let's say, helping us avoid a tragedy of the commons or a race to the bottom mm -hmm. so that we all succeed better than we would if we, if it was, you know, all against all. Well, what you don't want to do is set up a system in which somebody who decides to extract resources from that system rather than supply the right level of resources for it to do the job that we've all agreed it should do, mm -hmm. if that person is slapped on the wrist for attempting to corrupt the system when you catch them, then actually they've got a reasonably good strategy because you mm -hmm. won't catch them all the time. Right. Okay. And okay. so you don't catch them all the time, which means they've got a cost of doing business, which is the slap on the wrist they get each time they get caught. And they've got information about the system, which is, oh, when I do it this way, it doesn't get noticed. So I'm going to stop doing it the way I keep getting slapped on the wrist. And I'm going to do it in the way that I don't get slapped on the wrist. And then it's all profit. Uh -huh. Okay. So now I'm training this corrupting force, this parasite to be a better parasite, to be more effective okay. at evading detection yeah. and to, to reap a higher profit. I don't want that arms race. Right. So my point is to get the system to work, you want people to be rewarded for contributing positively to it, right? I am a big fan of the idea that you should get wealthy by creating wealth that we all benefit from, mm -hmm. right? We do not want equal outcomes. Equal outcomes will, you know, of course, they kill we're only us. equal in the grave, basically. Right. Yeah. So what you want is opportunity distributed as broadly as possible. You want excellent rewards for contributing. The more you contribute, the more you should be rewarded. Mm -hmm. But again, if somebody decides to, you know, to concentrate the opportunity so it only exists for a limited number of people, they're actually harming mm -hmm. all of us, right? Right? Because yeah. how many people who would have contributed sure. something don't have the opportunity to do it, and so yeah. we don't get to benefit from it. So you don't want to create the arms race that trains people to be excellent parasites, which mm -hmm. means that the cost for discovering, when you discover a parasite, the cost has to be ruinous so that instead of coming out ahead and paying the cost of doing business for the places that you got spotted, that any attempt to find where you can't be seen results in a massive setback. Hmm. If it results in a massive setback, then all of the, you know, the the mm -hmm. early attempts to figure out where the, you know, the gaps in surveillance are, they all perish. Hmm. And who succeeds? All of the people who decided, you know what, I'm not going to try to figure out how to parasitize the system. I'm going to try to figure out how to contribute to the system because that's how I get rewarded, hmm. right? It's that simple. So make parasitism unprofitable. Make it... In an energetic way. Right. And, and financial way. Don't make yeah. the mistake of thinking that making it somewhat unprofitable is enough because if it's somewhat unprofitable, it then all of the cases in which you didn't detect it are going to overwhelm whatever right. fine you have imposed and it will still be profitable. Yes. Okay. That is an excellent point. This might be a step back, but I think it's an important one. So my understanding of the word corruption, at least in socioeconomics, is an 
uneven application of the rules. You know, we've heard the word lawfare thrown yep. around a lot recently where, well, there's a law it's supposed to apply to everyone evenly, right? We're all equal in the eyes of the law. This is like a, a principle at the bottom of Western civilization. But when you get in, and this is one equality that I think we really should keep, mm -hmm. equality in the eyes of the law, not equality of outcomes, not equality, not even equality of opportunity, by the way, because we're all born different in different places, different times. Agreed, strive to make opportunity as broadly distributed as possible, but it's not something we can equalize per se. It will never be perfectly equal. Yes. You want it as equal as possible. But we can have perfect equality in the eyes of the law. Must. In theory, I mean, we could. We haven't seen it in practice so much. Um, it, and then so corruption would be inequality in the eyes of the law in a socioeconomic sense. So what is the what is the value of universally or evenly applied laws in preventing corruption? Well, I mean, I think I think you spotted it, which is when we say that we all benefit from having opportunity as evenly available as can be can be made mm -hmm. um, to the extent that the law is scrutinizing your finances more than it's scrutinizing someone else's finances, that's, you know, that's an opportunity for them that doesn't exist for you. Mm -hmm. They can cheat where you can't. Right. So um, I would say that corruption is born of a failure, often a cryptic failure, to agree on the values around which your structure is built. Mm. And values are really... You know, values are the objectives of right. the system. What, are you, what do you want it to achieve? And then there are the structures which are going to fall short of achieving the values mm -hmm. perfectly, and you want them to fall short as little as possible. It would be great if the structures got better over time yeah. at achieving those values. But basically, I am a huge fan of the idea that the rules posted at the door are the key to a functional civilization, mm. right? I don't want to participate in a civilization with people who do not believe in equal protection under the law. Right. Right. My feeling is either you get that principle or you don't. And so if you don't, I can't trust you. You're referring to something like the Bill of Rights when you say posted at the door? Yeah. yeah okay. Something yeah, like that. Yeah. And, you know, the Bill of Rights I take to be a prototype that mm -hmm. was, I believe, as good as could have been achieved given yeah. what was understood at the time. I mean, the founders didn't know about evolution and so they didn't understand sure. that they were building a system with the component parts that would cause it to evolve and therefore maybe they didn't, uh, they didn't anticipate some of the failures. But, but yeah, rules posted at the door says, look, we are not gonna equalize outcomes, for example. Mm -hmm. We are going to attempt to equalize opportunity and we are not going to obsess over inefficiencies of the system, right? The fact that opportunity is not perfectly mm -hmm. evenly distributed is be. not a reason yeah. to overthrow the system. Right, right, right. right. So no, no wokeism. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. no wokeism, right. right. We all yeah. want, we all want yeah. everybody yeah. to have equal opportunity. Yeah. We agree that nothing's perfect, right? But that's an, an ideal. Yeah, it yeah. will never be. An engineer builds tolerances in because you can't make two parts that are exactly the right, right. size. You'll never get them together. Um, but yeah, well, having agreed on the basic values, um, then the question is, well, what's the structure that achieves our objectives best? So these basic values, I mean, now this gets deep because now you're in, there's almost a religious substructure to the ethical substructure to the legal substructure, right? Like we have the King James Bible at the bottom of Western civilization, more or less, so thou shall not kill, thou shall not steal, things like this become codified as the rules posted at the door. I mean, I guess they're not, that's not exactly the Bill of Rights, but you know, we, we build towards that, as you said, like those are the basic primitives, and then we build towards these bigger and better prototypes over time. Private property um, seems to be like a very important one of those, right? It's kind of like thou shall not steal, basically, in a socially institutionalized form um, and in the to the end of rewarding those who are productive and not rewarding those or even punishing those who are parasitical mm -hmm. private property does seem to be that thing right because if you if someone violates your private property well then you can sue them in the court of law and introduce ruinous costs to them 
at least pre-limited liability, you know, there's a lot of distortions that have occurred in the modern day, but that's the theory at least. And then also, well, when you consensually serve other people and solve their problems and they pay you for it, well, that's how you can build uh, legit, honest wealth, let's say. So what what's the importance of the integrity of private property to this process you're describing of rewarding productive and, and penalizing the parasitical. All right. I'm going to come back to that, but I want to okay. pick up an important point at the end of the day. I don't believe, and maybe the reason that you started with a religious underpinning is that absent such an untestable metaphysical claim, mm -hmm. You can't really ground any of this should stuff in the physics of the universe. Mm -hmm. Right. Can't get it out from an is, right? Yeah. And this has profound and immediate implications. Yeah. I literally cannot defend and do not believe that anybody could properly defend the idea that it is better to be alive than dead. <sighs> Yeah, I mean, you can't can't defend the contrary, right? I mean, on what basis is it better? Yeah, and the answer is well, it, as a living creature, it's better. But you it's know, a, well, my it's a bias is built in. It's a performative contradiction by a living creature to say that, <laughs> right? Right. So if we say, well, actually, there's no, it's not really superior. It's more organized, mm -hmm. right? But yeah. it's not really superior, right? Um, then the question is, well. Can we accept that for all of us who are doing the arguing about this, we prefer to be alive than to be dead? Yeah. And the answer is, oh, yeah, it's a slam dunk, right? <laughs> In fact, you can prove that everybody feels this way because pretty much everybody, uh, you know, Anyone decides to take their next breath. Exactly. Right? Anyone that hasn't killed themselves is right. performing it. Yes. Okay. Yes. So the, then the point is, yeah. okay, I'm not claiming that this is grounded in the physics, mm -hmm. but once you get to life, yeah, life is good, yes. right? Yeah. And... I also think then you can say, well, you know, is all life good? If you were, you know, strapped to a rack being tortured every minute of every day, is that life right. good? Right. No, I don't think so. Um, so there's something to being, you know, in a life that is, that has rewarding characteristics that isn't all suffering. Oh. Does that mean you want it to be all pleasure? Nope. That would turn you into a yep. awful unproductive something so yep. a life in which you are free you struggle you suffer from your bad judgment you profit by becoming insightful and wise yep. that's the life that we want yeah. that's the and profit the, in serving others right right yeah in, yeah. Pr in producing yeah. something yeah. something of value either through your work or your insight or your compassion or mm. your sense of beauty or whatever it is um so once we get there then I think it becomes really obvious that, you know, agreeing that the step at the bottom is just, I like life better than not life. Mm -hmm. We have an obligation to deliver to as many human beings as we can the most liberated, meaningful opportunity at life mm -hmm. that we can deliver. Mm -hmm. Does that mean maximizing the population on the planet? Nope. It means preserving the opportunity to live here mm -hmm. indefinitely into the future, figuring out how many people the planet can handle and not stretching it to its limits, mm -hmm. right? I don't know what that number is. I think there's a lot of discussion about the population being too low and dropping and mm -hmm. the catastrophe. I really don't know what the number that the planet can tolerate and is. There's arguments on the other side from yep. the globalists, right? Sure. Yeah. And and all I want is an honest discussion of it where we can yeah. figure out, are we above carrying capacity? Are we below it? Mm -hmm. uh, how do we stabilize so that we, mm -hmm. you know, don't create a demographic problem for ourselves? But and it is dynamic anyways, because as innovation changes, our carrying capacity changes. Right. Yeah. And, you know, the quality of our lives change, sure. right? Yeah. And so, you know, I want I want people to have this as a delightful experience, and every minute of it is precious. And yeah. I want as many people to get a shot at that as we can give. Yeah. But you know, packing the maximum number of people on the planet is not the way to do it. But all that said, if our obligation is to preserve this opportunity 
as long as we can, mm -hmm. then that creates an obligation towards, dare I say, sustainability, mm -hmm. right? Which I know mm -hmm. is a dirty word because yeah. it's been so abused by folks it, yeah. on the ostensible left. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. But nonetheless, if we were to, you know, take all of the stigma away from that term, right. I think we have an obligation not to deliver the next generation a worse planet than, than we inherited. Yes. No, I fully, anyone that doesn't agree with that, by the way, I think is got a problem i mean i don't know i don't know how you couldn't agree with that right as, right as At a mature go back and as a mature it. living adult right like maybe there's some selfish teenagers that haven't seen it all yet but yeah it's a gift yeah right and it's in a way our purpose our duty i guess to afford that gift the furtherance of that gift to later generations right that's yep. And it, it's not, again, as you said, there's no ought from an is. This isn't coded into the universe necessarily, but we do value being alive by virtue of the way we act and are. And so we, we know that about ourselves. We can presume that about future generations that we should then give them the optimal conditions to flourish, basically. Which I think... I'm going to look up a quote. I'm going to listen to you, but I have okay. something... You're sounding like a, a Randian to me, so I want to pull up this quote. <laughs> so I think that this philosophical view actually solves an important problem. If you start thinking about species as sacred by virtue of the fact that they exist, and you start arguing, well, you know, does every species of mosquito have a right to mm. exist? Does every pathogen that's ever evolved right. have a right to be preserved? My answer is hell no. Right. Right. We actually should center our calculation of the planet that we are passing on mm -hmm. on human values. Yes. And course. allow for the possibility that future generations will value things that we haven't found the value in yet. Yes. But this means you can, you know, figure out whether or not Anopheles mosquitoes could be driven extinct. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a way to get rid of malaria. Maybe that yeah. would be net negative, but there's a strong argument it would be net positive. Right. And, but hard to imagine an argument in which you don't have to preserve the ocean so that they sustain sure. orcas, Yeah. right? Right. Future generations have a right to live on a planet with orcas. Yeah. And um, so anyway, I think that by focusing on humans, you actually end up yes. with a natural guide to what in nature we have to, we are obligated to preserve. I could not agree more, right? That it has to serve human purposes because what, I mean, it's, it's biological, right? If we're not serving human purposes, well, then we won't be here to, right? whatever we're not protecting now or not doing right, like we won't even be here to do it right in the future. And, the and if you... If you think about this, yeah. right, the thing that we talked about, about fitness, what is fitness really? Mm -hmm. Fitness is the ability to get as far into the future as you can. Right. We have just spelled out the program for doing the best job we yes. can based on what we know now. Yes. Okay. So I am in total agreement with you. I think my view as a libertarian would be that private property is this strategy, at least the basis of the strategy. Obviously it's complicated, right? You need the rule of law. You need these rules written at the door, things like this, principles of governance to get people organized. But fundamental to that, I really do think is private property. And when you were saying a quote earlier, this is the Rand quote that came up for me. Ayn Rand, of course, said, the right to life is the source of all rights, which I think is what you were saying when you said life is good, right? And, that's, and the right to property is their only implementation. Without property rights, no other rights are possible. This is actually the shorter version of it, but she basically says later that if a man doesn't have the rights to the product of his own effort, and it is his effort that sustains his life, then he does not have his right to life, basically. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this episode, click here to find more just like it, and here to find our most recent episode. Also, make sure to like this video to help shine light on the corruption of money. And be sure to subscribe to this channel to stay connected.